I know that in the first mass shooting in, in El Paso, uh, you know, that was a, an avowed white supremacist. Uh, it's not uncommon anymore to have white supremacists uh, put out a manifesto, go into a public area, attack the most vulnerable populations in this country, or whether it's in New Zealand, it was, uh, you know, two mosques. Uh, you know, these are people that are often refugees or are, you know, leaving areas that are already politically, socially uh, unstable. The climate probably plays a big part in that instability as well. And we're seeing, again, the sentiment of, of resentment, of hatred towards these groups by these very disaffected human beings. And I just want to get a sense of your how right-wing populism, right-wing violence, terrorism is being stoked, whether it's in a subtle or maybe even not very subtle way at all, is being stoked by the climate crisis. And how I know that in this manifesto that this guy in uh, El Paso released before the shooting, there was some mention of of some eco, uh, some sort of environmental, uh, kind of eco-fascist environmentalism, this idea that we have to protect our resources from these people. And and I know that the the shooter in, uh, in New Zealand also made reference to this as well. So I just want to get your take on that. Like, how do you sense that this is tied in with the climate crisis? I think that it is tied into the climate crisis in that it is at least in part, uh, and I have no doubt that it is at least in part, uh, if not a large part, a result of this ongoing anxiety that uh, I briefly mentioned earlier when we kind of was we're going through the broad brushstrokes of some of the, the the ongoing and more recent impacts of of climate disruption. And so we we know that you know we're essentially animals, right? You know, humans, no matter how much we want to try to pretend how sophisticated we are in all this at base. We are animals and we have these primal instincts and intuitions. And just like when you uh, watch a deer uh, in, in nature and when that deer senses anything around it in its environment that's out of balance, it immediately stops and looks up and listens and pays attention because it can tell that there's a potential for danger. And in the same way with humans that instinctually, even those of us who are in full-blown denial of the crisis. Well, those people are in denial of something. They are in denial for a reason. They are in denial because some part of them knows that there is something terribly, terribly wrong with what's happening on the planet, uh, climatologically, politically, etc. And so uh, it that is really a, a kind of a perfect baseline for people who are not then going deeper into that, wondering, what is this? I need to look at this. There's something wrong here. I need to investigate and figuring out and getting the hard truths and then going through what we each have to go through individually to, to, I don't, I wouldn't say come to peace. I don't think that's really possible to come to some place of peace with what's happening, but, but come to terms with it, to literally come to terms with, we are in a crisis Let's be honest about how bad it means. Let's be honest about the fact that, yes, it could well even mean the extinction of our own species, let alone uh, uh, so much of the rest of life on Earth. Come to terms with that and then start to deal with it how we each feel like we need to deal with it. And instead of that, if we stay in this denial and then, you know, this demagogue of Trump shows up and he starts giving people scapegoats and, and, and people and things to blame, enabling people to not take personal responsibility for what's really going on and instead saying, oh, it's the Hispanics or it's the blacks or it's, you know, these four women in Congress or what have you. And, and of course, it's going to be the perfect setting for the kind of ghastly blood uh, letting that we're seeing happening. You know what? We're where, uh, you know, there's already been over 250 mass shootings in this country in this year alone. I mean, it's it's complete insanity. And then, of course, you know, we're in this temporary reprieve of 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 Trump, you know, throwing more fuel on the fire. And we, we can rest assured that before this podcast even is 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 made available for the public, he'll be back at it. Uh, pointing the finger and scapegoating and, and throwing red meat to the masses. And, and and we're only going to see more. We know this. You know, here we have uh, one of the single deadliest mass shootings in the history of this country. Nothing has changed. 
and nothing will change. And so, you know, another layer I want to then bring into this is how I see is, you know, we're, we're in the final stages of disintegration of this neo-capitalist experiment that this country has turned into with a, a dumbed down, disinformed, distracted public. And we have literally a reality TV, racist, uh, sexist, xenophobic, insane person propped up as president while the corporate powers behind him are literally looting and taking what's left of this country. And, uh, and, you know, and yet we still have this facade that people are pretending as though this is and ever was a real democracy and that there will be something like a real election in 2020 as though there is a chance for someone that's going to replace this man who's already sent out those trial balloons that you mentioned earlier, uh, uh, preparing people for what if he doesn't leave? What if under any circumstances, even if there was a legitimate election, what if he doesn't leave? And people are going to be surprised as though, as though you know, but look at it this way. If in, if in Russia, if there was an election, do you think Putin would actually really stand a chance of losing that election? And yet people here in this country like to continue pretending just like the climate crisis isn't maybe quite as severe. Maybe we still have 10 or 11 years left to deal with it. Well, I see I see politically that same disconnect and soft denialism that, oh, well, we're not already in an authoritarian state and maybe uh, in the next election things are going to change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is this sort of general sense that I get from people that actually, yeah, we still live in a democracy where we still have our voices heard and that that, you know, the democratic debates or, you know, whatever is, is, uh, you know, it, it was a significant thing to pay attention to. I, I remember watching several clips and I think they only mentioned climate change for, I think there was what, seven minutes. Is that what it was? There was like maybe. Exactly. Exactly. I was yeah. going to bring it up too. And yeah. the first, uh, another perfect example of this so-called democracy that, you know, it, it's the, all the recent polling shows that the single biggest issue with democratic voters is the climate crisis. And yet in the first so-called presidential debate among the Democrats, it gets a whopping seven minutes of airtime, which was something like seven times more than it ever had ever even gotten in previous debates, as pathetic as that is. And so, so that's another perfect indication of this so-called democracy. 